It's the last message, so I have all the things tonight, all the things. So, Father, we just thank you that you are here and that I offer my, uh, myself to be used by you tonight. I ask you that every word would just bring revelation about drawing near to you, about uh, prayer, about your, our place in your plan of prayer for this uh, world and your plan in this world. And Father, I just ask you to speak through me clearly so that we walk out of here with an effective prayer life, Father, one that gets an answer in Jesus' name. Amen. And so this is the last one. I'm so sad. It's been fun. How many of you have learned anything? I told uh, Ann today when we're, maybe it was you, I don't remember. I've even learned stuff as I've been finishing. I'm like, man, that was really good. <laughs> I want to write that down when I get home because the Holy Spirit is just good. So, all right, we've been reading uh, quotes every week, so this will not be any different. I just have a couple little quotes. Uh, for you on prayer, the first one is nine times out of ten, falling away from God begins in the neglect of private prayer. Charles Spurgeon said that. Nine times out of ten, falling away from God begins with the neglect of private prayer. And then um, <clears throat> Henry Martin said, my present deadness I attribute to want of sufficient time and tranquility of private devotion, oh, that I might be a man of prayer. And then Andrew Bonar said, oh, brother, pray. In spite of Satan, pray. Spend hours in prayer. Rather neglect friends than not pray. Rather fast and lose breakfast, dinner, tea, and supper, and sleep too than not pray. We must not just talk about prayer. We must pray and write earnest. And so uh, I wholeheartedly agree with every single one of those. If you talk to any or look and dissect the life of anyone who walks away from God, they stopped spending time with him. And so we're talking about the foundation of an effective prayer life. This is, was not like the how-tos, and this is lesson six. So if you missed one through five, you can go back on the app, you can go to the website, you can go to Facebook Live, you can watch them or listen to them if you want to listen to all of them, but we're laying a foundation for an effective prayer life. It's not a formula, this is a lifestyle. And an effective prayer life is one that gets an answer, because what's the point if you don't... Um, I can't remember who said it, but they said, um, don't let anything pass as prayer that you don't expect God to answer. It's not just some ritual that we do just to check a box and to say, man, I feel good about myself because I prayed today. There's a purpose to prayer, and it's to get an answer. But in the first lesson, we talked about why do I need to pray? Remember, we said God needs our voice. If God is any expression in this earth, it has to come through his church. And then we spent two weeks talking about an effective prayer life is rooted in confidence and trust. That's all based in relationship. And then the next week we talked about where do we pray and when do we pray? Everywhere and all the time, right? And we looked at the in depth what that looked like. And then last, last week we talked about the word. Your prayer life, and not just your prayer life, your Christian life must be founded on the Word, or you're never going to make it to the end. I'm doing a really interesting read through the New Testament this year, doing it in a different way than normal, but I'm using different colors to highlight things, and I'm using orange to highlight everywhere he talks about the possibility of falling away before you get to the end. And there's a lot of orange in my New Testament. Beware, be on guard, talks about all of it. Lest you forfeit the prize, lest you not make it to the end. The word has, was 
was very, very prevalent in all of those. If your feet are not planted on the word, if your roots of your heart don't go deep into the word, you're going to sway, you're going to be tossed, you're going to be tossed aside, and you're going to walk away. So we don't want that. And remember we said, don't be goofy. Remember we talked about being goofy? We don't want to be goofy. We want our prayers based on the word of God. And so if you weren't here, you want to go back and listen to that one and hear some of the goofy stuff. But the enemy's number one goal is to stop the plan of God. His number one goal in this earth is to stop the plan of God. Why? Because his demise is at the end of it. And he's not in any hurry to get to the end of it. He wants to stop the plan of God. And uh, he has no offensive strategy. He's not creative in and of himself. His only strategy is to come against you to get you to stop. And I think sometimes he's more of a believer in the power of prayer than the church is. Because he knows what happens to his kingdom when we pray. So he does everything to distract, to hinder, and to pull you away from prayer. And so uh, we want to make sure that we stand steadfast in what God has called us to do, and that is to pray. His only, his only success in our life is when we surrender. The only victory he ever gains over us is our surrender, when we lay down what God has promised us. And we surrender in the silence of not praying. To withhold your prayer is to withhold the power of God. And so when, you, when you're sitting silent, you're surrendering the power of God. You're surrendering the situation to the enemy. And I just don't, I don't like to surrender. I do not like to quit. And I really like to win. Really, 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 I'm really not sure where Alex got his competitive drive, but it may not have been from me. So the enemy's number one goal is to stop the plan of God, and the church's number one job is to pray. And it's our first assignment in the Lord is to pray. And before he ever turned to his disciples and said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, he said, pray for laborers. Prayer came First, it's the first assignment of the church, and we're to pray in the plans of God, and we're to stop the plans of the enemy, and we do all that with prayer. Ephesians 6.18 says, pray at all times, on every occasion, in every season, in the spirit, with all manner of prayer and entreaty, to that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding in behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people. And so what we're going to talk about tonight, the last layer of our foundation, uh, prayer foundation, is spirit-led prayer. We're going to talk about praying in the spirit. And so Ephesians 6.18 says, pray in the spirit on all occasions. And so the first thought of most Pentecostal people is that means to what? Pray in tongues, which it might include praying in tongues, and does include praying in tongues. And we're going to talk about that just briefly tonight. But the literal Greek translation of that Greek scholars say is to pray being led by the Spirit. Pray being led by the Spirit. And this is really, we're going to keep referring back to having that foundation of the Word. Because we need our foundation in the word to know the will of God before we can ever be praying led by the spirit. Because the spirit is going to always lead you in line with the word. If he ever leads you apart from the word, it wasn't the spirit of God. Okay? Just mark that down. And if you have a question about it, call us. Call the church. <laughs> and say, hey, listen. This is what I'm thinking about praying. Does it line up with the word? <laughs> we will tell you yes or no, I promise you. That's what we're here for, to help you. And so we don't want to forget our foundation in the word. We're going to go to Matthew 16. And um, I'm going to read it really, really quick. 
Starting in verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Hold on to that word, church. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. That's not good news to the ears of the disciples. How would you like it if your best friend came up and said, I'm about to be killed? You'd have some emotions about that, don't you think? <laughs> You're allowed to have emotions. Emotions aren't bad. Did, have we talked about emotions on Wednesday nights yet? <laughs> emotions are not wicked. They're not evil. God gave them to you. God has them. He said, in your anger, do not sin. He didn't say, don't be angry. <laughs> and so um, Peter's listening to all of this and reacts out of his emotions. Emotions are locators. They're not leaders. They tell you what's going on inside of you, but they don't get to make your decisions for you. You need to process those before you respond, okay? Peter was not known to be a, a, a good processor. He was more of a reactor, right? Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. <laughs> Jesus, you're wrong. Can you imagine telling Jesus that he's wrong, reprimanding him? You know what that word means? Correcting. Peter corrected Jesus. Now, take a step back. If I asked you, have you ever corrected Jesus, what would you say? Have you ever told him that he wasn't answering your prayer fast enough? Have you ever said, Jesus, why is this happening in my life? Why did you let this happen in my life? You were basically telling him he was wrong and what you wanted was right. <laughs> and we can go into that another day. But um, we get down on Peter, but we've also corrected Jesus, so... Help us, Lord. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned, and we talked about that before, about using the keys. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. This is what I want to get to. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. So we're talking about spirit-led prayer, and we're laying the foundation of that right now. Um, he, Peter was seeing things from a human point of view and not from God's. Peter was reacting out of what he felt. He had emotion about it. He didn't want that to happen. But in essence, if he had been praying, he would have been saying, Father God, do not let the redemption of all mankind happen. Heaven forbid the redemption of all mankind. Why? Because he didn't understand. He was not reacting about the will of God regarding about what was about to happen because he didn't know what was about to happen. He didn't have an understanding like Jesus had an understanding of what God was getting ready to do. So Peter was only drawing conclusions based on what he could hear, see, feel, the senses. But spirit-led prayer is not sense-led prayer. It's awfully quiet in here. Somebody tell me you're listening. <laughs> 
It's easy to put our interpretation on things and be wrong. Natural things, things that we see with our eyes and things that we see going on around us. It's easy to put our interpretation on natural things and be wrong. We saw it with the last election. How many prophet after prophet after prophecy after prophecy that Donald Trump was going to be elected again? Convinced of it. God said. How many said God said? Hundreds of them all over Facebook. But were they right? They had put their interpretation on what they wanted to happen in this nation and declared it to be thus said the Lord. We need to hold some things loosely because we don't always see things from his perspective. And so we want to be very, very careful about putting our interpretation on what we see, what we sense, what we hear, even what we think we're hearing God saying. We want to hold really loosely to all of that and hold really tightly to the word of God. Because we could be wrong. Peter was wrong. It's easy to be moved by our comfort and what we want to see happen and not by the Spirit of God. So we want to hold loosely to that. Jeremiah 1, we're going to read 9 through 12. It says, Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, Look, I have put my words in your mouth, and today I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some you must uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow. Others you must build up and plant. Then the Lord said to me, Look, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I replied, I see a branch from an almond tree. That's what Jeremiah said. And this is verse 12. If you saw a branch from an almond tree from, in a vision from the Lord, would you put an interpretation on it? Is this what you would think it meant? And the Lord said, that's right, meaning that's what you should be seeing. And it means that I am watching and I will certainly carry out all my plans. I personally wouldn't have put that interpretation on seeing an almond branch. And actually, I studied it a little bit. And some scholars say the closest connection they can make to that is that the word for almond branch rhymes with the word for watch. It's a little bit of a stretch. Why? Because as humans, we try to make sense of things. We're logical creatures, and we need to understand, and we need to make sense of things. But here's the thing. Sometimes what God puts in your heart to pray is going to make zero sense whatsoever, and you have to be okay with that. You have to be okay with living in a mystery of not understanding fully what God planned and what God needs prayed. And what does Corinthians say? 1 Corinthians 13, I know in part and I prophesy in part, which means you get a part and 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 nobody gets the whole picture. I love that. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says, or 2 says, if you pray in other tongues, the, you're uh, speaking not unto men, but unto God, speaking mysteries, secret things and hidden truths not revealed to your understanding. We have to be okay with God leaving some things in mystery. But then there's the tension of he needs things prayed. He needs things that only he knows prayed on this earth. Are you with me? And partly that is going to be praying in, in tongues. It's going to be praying in other tongues. You're praying out those mysteries. The Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, when I pray in the spirit, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. 
That means it's okay that your mind doesn't understand what your heart is doing, but your heart still needs to do it. But we're going to look at cases tonight where God gave specific unction for them to declare and to ask him some things in English so he could bring it to pass. And that's not abnormal, and he wants to do that not just through pastors, but through people, his people. And so the um, prophetic things, and uh, we hear a lot about the prophetic Prophetic words, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and there's, there's that aspect of the gifts of the Spirit that are supposed to be functioning in the church. And we think of them just from up here. When Pastor Michael says, ah, you, have we ever met? And then he, he, he speaks a word of encouragement to them by the Spirit of God. That's a prophetic thing. But the prophetic things are not just to be from here. There is a prophetic aspect to prayer that happens in our prayer closet. And before I ever even experienced it happening up here, I've spent decades experiencing it in my prayer closet. And so we're going to look at just a couple of these stories tonight in Genesis 18. And this is the story of uh, Abraham praying for um, Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to read just a couple of these verses. Verse 17 says, "Should this is the Lord speaking, should I hide my plan from Abraham? For Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. I have singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Then I will do for Abraham all that I have promised. So the Lord told Abraham, I have heard a great outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin is so flagrant. I am going down to see if their actions are as wicked as I have heard. If not, I want to know. The other men turned and headed toward Sodom, but the Lord remained with Abraham. And Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away both the righteous and the wicked? Suppose you find 50 righteous people living there in the city. Will you still sweep it away and not spare it for their sakes? Surely you wouldn't do such a thing, destroying the righteous along with the wicked. Why would you would be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same? Surely you wouldn't do that. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And the Lord replied, if I find 50 righteous people in Sodom, I will spare the entire city for their sake. And it went on, and he said, well, 45 and 40 and 30 and 20, and he went down to 10. And I think if he would have gone to 5, God would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah because he was looking for someone to stand in the gap. So Abraham prayed, and God didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah. There weren't 10 righteous people there, but he did rescue Abraham's family because Abraham asked. Did Abraham read about an impending attack? on Sodom and Gomorrah in the news? Did he see it on Facebook? Who revealed it to him? God is a revealer of things that are about to happen that he wants someone to stand in the gap to intervene on. Does that make sense? God revealed to Abraham so that Abraham would reason with him and contend with him about that. Spirit-led prayer. And we talked about during the when do we pray and about different times to pray. And absolutely, when we see things on the news, we need to pray. When we see destruction foreboding, we, we want to pray and, and ask God to intervene. But there's, there's a higher realm that we can be walking in of him revealing things before they happen so that we can stand in the gap to intervene before there's a crisis to clean up. And he's still a revealer. If you don't think he sees what's, what's about to happen, if you don't think God has a plan about what's about to happen, and that's why it's so important to hold loosely our interpretation of it and set our emotions aside it's not what I want, but what you want, Lord. Why? Because he's setting things up for the end. 
He's got a bigger plan than just your bank account. He's got a bigger plan than just you wanting to be in a new house next year. He's not opposed to you having a new house and a bank account that's comfortable. But if, if your prayers only revolve in this realm, you're falling a little short on helping the plan of God. He's got a bigger plan, and he needs people praying on that stage. And he's just waiting for friends like Abraham who are willing to say, show me, Lord. What do you need prayed today, God, on any platform? It's, a, it's an exciting adventure to pray this way with God, and it spoils you for any other kind of praying. Because once you pray in this direction, it's, it's an adventure. It's exciting because, because there's an intimacy with it, with the Father. And that he could use Abraham in this way, and he could trust Abraham in this way. And that's what he said. Should I hide from Abraham? Surely he's going to be this person. You know why I know that? Because I can trust him, because this is Genesis 18. And when he first called him, it was back in Genesis uh, 12. And this is decades into his walk with God. It was before Isaac was born, but long after he left his homeland. And there was, there was uh, established evidence of a walk with God and Abraham showed himself to be trustworthy and intimately uh, walking with the father and so God could trust him to say should I hide my plan from him now if you're going to take what God shows you and go blab it all over Facebook he's not going to show you much very long because he's looking for people he can trust and that comes in intimacy, which takes us back to week number two and three of it being rooted in confidence and trust. And that's built in relationship day in, day out, walking with God. So this is intimacy. Luke 22, 31 and 32. We'll hop over to the New Testament. <clears throat> And this is Jesus, Jesus, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. So this is Jesus looking at Peter saying, you know what? Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And when you repent and come back, strengthen your brothers. I love this because, again, Jesus didn't read this in the newspaper. Impending attack on Peter. Satan's after him. He better go hide. The Spirit of God revealed this to Jesus so that Jesus could stand in the gap for Peter and pray. But what, what did he pray? What did Jesus pray? Who's looking at the scripture? But I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. I have always found that interesting. Because if it was me, I would have prayed that Peter wouldn't fall. Anybody ever had that thought? Why didn't he pray for Peter not to fall? Strengthen him, Lord, so that, it's, that he doesn't fall. Strengthen him, Lord, so that he doesn't fail. But that's not what Jesus prayed. He prayed that his faith wouldn't fail when he fell. Spirit-led prayer. I just, I, that's why it's so important to let him direct our prayer life. And I personally am glad that he allowed Peter to make those decisions and to fall and to be restored so I, we could see him as the God who restores even the one that did something like that. Man, that's a bad one. He turned his back on and denied Jesus three times. 
We look all over the world right now, and there's people who are, are under threat of martyrdom. Deny Jesus or get your head cut off. Deny Jesus or go to jail, and they refuse to deny Jesus. But we look here at Peter who denied Jesus, and he wasn't even being threatened with death. And yet Jesus restored him and used him so powerfully in the church. And I'm glad, for one, that he didn't pray that he wouldn't fall. I'm glad that he prayed that his faith wouldn't fail so that we could see that even when we fall, our faith can stay strong. Isn't God good? Be led by the Spirit. Acts 21, 10 through 14. Talking about Spirit-led, talking about God is a revealer, right? Right? And that we need to be led, even when he reveals something, led in how to pray. And um, you know what? Let's go to, real quick before we go here. I just want to look at Isaiah chapter 40. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 40. I'm getting there. Verse 1. 2, 3. Verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And then the voice said to me, cry out. And Isaiah said, what shall I cry? And God said, say, all flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. And then he goes on. But if God looked at you and said, shout, would you say, what should I shout? Or would you just go, glory? We immediately go into what we've always done or what we've always said or what we've always prayed and what God's waiting for is someone to say, oh, what, what would you like me to shout? What do you need prayed today, Lord? What would you like me to shout? Because he has an agenda and he has a plan. All right, now back to Acts, back to our reg regularly scheduled program of Acts 21. Several days later, a man named Agabus, who also had the gift of prophecy, arrived in Judea. He came over took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands with it as a, a, a display of what was going to happen. And then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. And when we heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. But Paul said, why all this weeping? You are breaking my heart. I am ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. When it was clear that we couldn't persuade him, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. You know, the Lord's will be done would have been a good place to start. <laughs> and Paul didn't say, no, you're wrong, Agabus. That far be it from me for that to happen to me. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. No, that was the Holy Spirit revealing something to him about Paul. Why? So that he could pray for it not to happen? No. As a warning or a confirmation, because Acts 21 comes after Acts 20, which says, and this is Paul saying, and now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem compelled. I'm compelled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what's waiting for me there, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And I just want to say, there's sometimes he's going to reveal stuff to us, not so that we can pray it away, but as confirmation that this is going to happen. 
Because if God revealed that to me, Michael's going to be bound and taken to jail. I'd start binding and rebuking and loosing angels and all of those things. But Paul was like, no, nope. this is the will and the plan of God. I must go to Jerusalem. And so it's so important when, when God starts to speak to you about things that we carry on that conversation with him. Lord, what do you mean by this? Lord, what do you need to, why are you revealing this and what do you need done with this information? The journal is going to be your best friend because it's human nature to tell. It is human nature to want to tell. Write it down. Find a trusted prayer partner that you can bounce things off of because if, you know, Oh, I'm, I'm really sensing that God wants me to pray for this. What do you think about that? We were praying for the governments last Wednesday, and I looked at Lori and said, man, he was leading me to pray something. I'm just not sure about that. I'm going to call my, my friend Patsy and say, you, have you thought about anything like this? Because you don't want to get what? Goofy. Right. Thank you, Mike. We don't want to get goofy, but there is an element and a realm of spirit-led prayer that the church needs to be walking in. We can stop some things before they start, and I'm just going to give you a couple examples, and we're going to close. In 2016, um, Michael had a blood clot. Who was here in 2016 that remembers the blood clot? And so... Um, Prior to, and that was in April, April of 2016, a couple months before that, I had a friend text me. They have a condo on the, on the beach in Hilton Head, and they wanted to let us have it for a week. Well, I didn't even need to pray about that. That's a no-brainer. Condo, free condo on the beach in Hilton Head in April. I am in. <laughs> like, sign me up. And we did. We responded immediately. That's a great blessing. Uh, we really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And so tickets were dirt cheap. Rental cars were dirt cheap. This was 2016, obviously, pre-COVID. But um, every time we went to buy the tickets, we didn't have peace. And I was like, oh, maybe the, maybe the prices are going to go down. You know, I'm ever the optimistic when it comes to going to the beach. Like, yeah, I'm going to get there. But every time we went to buy those tickets, we just had no peace. And the, the more we researched, the more I tried, the more uncomfortable I felt in my spirit. And I finally texted my friend. I said, please don't let this discount us forever. Should you ever, ever have another week open, we would gladly take it. But we just can't come. I don't understand it. I don't know. But um, I don't have peace. Michael doesn't have peace. We're just going to have to say no. So fast forward to April. Goes on the fishing trip. Flies home. Blood clot. Hello. God spared us. So he calls me from Florida the Wednesday and says, I am just in such incredible pain. I'm going to have your dad take me to the ER because he was with my dad on a fishing trip. And my brain went cha-ching, 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 ER. Can't you wait till urge care is open tomorrow? <laughs> like, come on. And, um, but, you know, I, you set that aside and, you know, whatever you need to do, baby, just do it. Well, he didn't. And uh, he said, just pray for me because I'm in incredible pain. And so I, we prayed what you would always pray. What do you pray? By his stripes, you are healed. We thank you, Father, that, you know, you sent your word and healed him. All the scriptures, all the right things. Didn't even think about it because it's a deep well. We have a well in us that you can just draw up out of that well. And uh, it's good and it's right. And we spoke the, and any time I thought of him, I spoke the word over him. He's the healed of the Lord. Hallelujah. Went to bed that night. <clears throat> The Lord woke me up about 2 o'clock in the morning and said, you need to pray for your husband. You need to pray for him right now. Spirit-led 
prayer. I didn't read that in a headline. If I would have waited, the headline would have probably been local pastor dies of blood clot. And so I got up in two hours just pacing my living room floor saying, all right, Lord, what do I pray? Because I already prayed. What do I pray? And he gave me very specific things to declare, very specific things to pray. And I could go into all the detail, but I won't. And a lot of praying in the spirit. Came home. We went to Alex's track meet. I think it was running that day. Came home. Michael tried to lay down, got up at midnight, went to the hospital. They thought it was a gallbladder attack. So they sent me home. They said, we're just going to do an ultrasound. You go home and get some rest. We'll probably be taking his gallbladder out tomorrow. So I went home, but I had, because I thought, well, I'll just go back in, you know, 7 or 8 o'clock. He'll be sleeping. I'll be sleeping, whatever. But I felt to get up again, pray, get in the shower, and get ready early. And... Um, Conveniently, the ultrasound tech wasn't there, so they had to do a CAT scan. If they had done the ultrasound, they wouldn't have found the blood clot. They would have sent him home on pepsin. But because she wasn't there, thank you, Lord, they had to do a CAT scan. They found the blood clot and life flighted him to UPMC. Nobody knew how he was still alive at either hospital with his story. Spirit-led life to number... So back to the beginning with the plane tickets, we would have been in Hilton Head without access to the same doctors, to the same hospitals. And how many of you know when you're on vacation, you're not as likely to go to the hospital? You're going to call it indigestion because he didn't go when he was on the fishing trip. God knows things far in advance. And when you're walking in that intimacy with him and being led by the Spirit of God, he's going to lead your prayer life. Does that make sense? And so um, prior to this, and I, I have a couple examples that I pull out just to talk about because I don't like to talk about a lot of it. I mean, that's why we have journals, guys. I want God to be able to trust me. This isn't just to say, look at me, I did this. This is examples of what God wants to do. So that was a family member. And so before that, <clears throat> Alex was a baby. And when he was a baby, he had white blonde curly hair. The cutest little thing you've ever seen in your whole wide life was that white blonde curly hair. All my kids were the cutest things you've ever seen, but that curly hair. And so... Um, I woke up in the middle of the night one night having this awful dream of a, of a male. I couldn't tell the age. All I could see, I knew was that it was a male laying on a sidewalk with a curly blonde hair in a pool of blood. And so, of course, I woke up and I, I was agitated in my spirit. So I went into the living room to press into it. I didn't just call it the pizza I ate that night. I, I said, all right, Lord, do you, do you need something prayed? Is this Alex? That's how I, he got my attention, I think, <laughs> because you're, you're going to be a little more in tune if it's going to be your child that needs protected. You're going to. And so I started just praying in the spirit, and uh, I got a sense right away that it wasn't Alex. And I could have just gone back to bed. Whew, not Alex. Maybe it was just the pizza. But I said, Lord, does somebody need prayer? And I felt just an unction from the Lord to press in a little bit more. So I just started praying in, this, in tongues a little bit more and said, God, you got to just show me. If I, don't, if I don't know, I don't know. But if you need something prayed, I'm here. And I don't even remember how long I prayed. But he had me pray some very specific things. And I just started calling out organs, like, kidneys and stomach and heart and just started calling out different organs and um, I prayed until it lifted until I thought okay that's I'm done you just know I'm done and so I said all right Lord and it was so unique to me that I wrote it in my journal because I thought this is just the strangest prayer that I've ever prayed I've never prayed for organs before 
But we have family in Hawaii who go to a church in Hawaii, and the pastor's son got mixed up in the wrong crowd and was outside of a bar in Honolulu at 2 o'clock in the morning one night and got attacked. And uh, I can't remember if it was 10 or 12, maybe more, got um, stabbed in his abdomen. And it missed every vital organ. And I was like, whoa. I took my journal because we were going over uh, a couple months after that to see his auntie and uncle. And so I took my journal and I showed his mom. Like, this is what I prayed, and this is when I prayed it. And it was just like, look at God. He loved. And sometimes we think, man, he was, in, he was on drugs and in, at a bar, and God wouldn't be concerned about him. You want to bet? Do you want to bet? And so thank the Lord. And so fast forward a few years after that. And uh, in 2010, we honestly considered moving to Hawaii. We actually t I, we took a three-week trip over there, took the kids over for three weeks. We were considering moving over there. I don't know if you know that's why we went. But um, they just thought we were on vacation. But I didn't want to pay $12 a pound for chip chop ham, so mm-mm. But at the environment over there is not ideal for raising kids either. It's, but um, we didn't have a piece about it, so we came back and just said, nope, that's not it. We're not doing that. Well, a little bit after that, I just had such a burden in my heart for Hawaii. And so I went on a walk, and I just started praying. I'm like, God, if we missed it, if you want us there, like, we will make the sacrifice. Legit, I didn't want to move there. That's far. It cost thousands of dollars to be able to fly back and see your family. That was not like anything I really, really wanted to do. I would winter there. I'm okay with that. But um, I, I, w I went on a walk, and I'm like, Lord, if, that's, if we missed it, we'll, we're surrendered to you. We'll do whatever you want us to do. But I knew that wasn't it. Sometimes you have to kind of start, and then he moves and directs. And I knew that wasn't it, and I knew I was praying for this young man again. And so I prayed, and I prayed in the Spirit, and I couldn't get a clear direction on what it was. But I prayed all that day and never got a release, never got a release. But I, I went to bed. I thought, Lord, I'll just I'll pray again tomorrow. If you bring it back, I'll pray again tomorrow. I'm just so tired. And that night... He went on a drug-induced killing spree and killed five people. One mother right in front of her daughter. And then he was uh, surrounded by police officers waving his gun at them. They had every right to shoot him, and they did not. And took him into custody, and I heard that, and I was like, God, I prayed. What? in the world happened there? Why did that still happen? And all the Holy Spirit said was, you don't know how bad it would have been if you wouldn't have prayed. But then um, I'm still in contact with his sister, and I was talking to her a little while after that, and um, I just said, how is, how is he? And she said, we just talked to him, and he said, I'll be in prison the rest of my life, but I've never been so free. Because his heart got free. He's leading Bible studies. He's leading people to the Lord in prison. Was that God's plan? Is that what God wanted for him? No. But he could turn around and use it for good. Those police officers could easily have shot him. But God uses prayer. Spirit-led prayer. And it doesn't even have to be big, heavy things like that. I had a friend um, earlier, well, late last week, that I was just sitting on my couch, and I thought, I'm going to pray for her. And I did, and I prayed some specific things, and I had a verse in my heart, and I just texted her, praying for you today, this is the verse. And she texted me immediately back, 
Sister, you'll never know how much I needed that right now. Spirit-led prayer. That's what he wants for all of us. It's an adventure that we can be on with God. Do we need to pray in the spirit, in tongues? Yeah, there's a mystery. And that goes along with spirit-led prayer. Because there's just things we're not going to understand with our mind. And we want to make sure not to put our interpretation on it, right? But to hold our interpretation loosely and just continue this conversation, constant conversation with the Lord. Okay, what do you mean? What do you need? Is there more? Does somebody else need prayer? If he finds a friend like that, a willing vessel like that, there's an intimacy with him that comes in that conversation that you don't get any other way. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I want all y'all to experience it. That's why we're teaching on it tonight. Because <laughs> it's fun. We're, it's time. It's 8.30, so I'm going to let y'all go. But I just have a couple thoughts to end with. This type of prayer, it comes with intimacy. But a foundation in the word of God. And also that confidence and trust we talked about. This is effective prayer. It's not just a formula. It's a lifestyle. It's so much more than praying for things. Although it's okay to pray for things. We need to. We have needs in our life, and he expects us to ask him. But it's a continual conversation with God that starts with, Good morning, Lord. What do you need today? Right? So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for this foundation in, the, in prayer that you have put into us over these last six lessons. And I just pray that it continues to take root and stir in us a hunger and desire to know you, to walk with you, and to be used of you in prayer so that your will can be done on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. Thanks for coming out tonight. We will see you on Sunday.